Hello, welcome everybody, and thank you for having me here. Um, that was a great talk. That was, I think that was the main course, and this would be sort of dessert. I'll keep it pretty light. Um, maybe some Irish coffee, I don't know. <laughs> so, my name is Okar Litter, and um, if I'm speaking like this, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, cool. So my name is Okar Litter. I work with IBM. Um, I'm a developer advocate. And my information on the screen here, I will share the slides with the meetups if you want to ask me questions later or just want to chit chat, I'm available. Also, I put up all the slides on GitHub um, as well as there's a link to sign up with IBM Cloud. And the reason being, IBM is giving away 1,500 drones over, <laughs> that's a lot of drones, I understand. Um, but this no. is, this, I, yeah, drones are taking over. I use help. Um, this is over a period of five weeks, so it's you know, 300 drones per, per week. They're pretty cool, you can program them. Um, and I think all you have to do is sign up on that page, it'll ask you for an email and uh, name, that's about it. Um, and then you have to be above 18 and, and living in the US or Canada. And they will draw 300 a week old on Twitch. So, so anyways, that information will also be on the video site, site if you want to get a little one of those. Um, I played with them, they're pretty cool, they have a camera. Uh, pretty decent battery life, um, so I hope you guys go get one. This is very small. Let's do this. Very big. I'm just going to go to the IBM Cloud page. So the point of that slide was to show you, um, show you IBM Cloud. So to get to the drone, or to, to get the drone, you have to complete a challenge, and for that you have to sign up with IBM Cloud. Um, and how many people here have used IBM Cloud before or played with it before? A handful. Okay. Um, so here are all the services. Once you do sign in, you get to the, you can go to the catalog to see what we provide. And here are some of the services on the left here. So I personally focus on our AI side, uh, which means Watson Assistant, which is chatbots, um, discovery service, uh, which is an NLP service. We have some language translators, um, as well as what we'll talk about today, which is visual recognition. Um, and that's one of the use cases for drones is to take a picture, send it off to Icon Cloud, um, and then see what's in it. Um, and then there is something called Watson Studio, which is a machine learning, deep learning suite of tools. And once you get in, you, it offers things like Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you've played with SPSS Modeler before, but the web version of that, SPSS Modeler 4 is in there as well. Um, and all of these you can try for free. So if it says light under a service, you get a certain usage per month, and then it resets every month. So that's my pitch about IBM Cloud. And this is still pretty small. Um, Let's see, I'll try and fix the resolution of the system. Okay. How do I do this? Are those the only two options? Okay. It's better maybe? My screen is all flickering, but it looks fine on the... <laughs> so we'll go with that one. It's more important. It's a little bit better, so bear with me. Um, this slide is here, so I feel better about pitching IBM Cloud if you do have a big presence in open source. Um, the two I focus on personally are, on the left there, there's something called Node-RED. Have you who's heard of Node-RED before? It's sort of a drag and drop interface to do JavaScript, create programs, more of a flow-based programming, they call it. Um, and then OpenVisc under that, that is our serverless. Um, platform serverless compute engine, and that's built on top of a whole bunch of other open source technologies, like uh, it uses Kafka for message help, it uses CouchDB for NoSQL database. Um, and all, actually all of our IBM Cloud is built on Cloud Foundry, which um, you know um, started by Pivotal, I believe, right? Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, cool. So yeah, uh, if you go to the IBM, IBM Open Source GitHub, GitHub page, you, sh you should see all of these projects there. Um, it's pretty cool that you know we have 
um, you know, sort of our hands and feet in all these projects and contribute back to open source. Uh, but just wanted to point, point that out to you guys. And then this is the other thing that I find developers like a lot is uh, our site on code patterns. And if you go to developer.i5.com forward slash patterns, you see on the left there there's a bunch of um, categories. And again, I'm going to go to the site itself. It's probably easier to do that. So if I go uh, developer.i5.com patterns. Okay, that looks better. So if you see here, there's a bunch of technologies that you can uh, filter using. Um, I'm sorry for it, I'm not sure why it's a little bit blurry. Um, but if I do pick uh, Java, what it gives you at the end of the day is, is essentially end-to-end uh, -end solutions in different use cases and industries, right? So if I were to go into one of these, um, right, if I were to go into creating an API, um, endpoint using API Connect and Secure Gateway, um, I can go into get the code, and it'll take me to the GitHub page, and for the most part, it tells you how to use it, but then there is also, once you clone it, you can, um, you essentially have to fill in some env file, and then you can run it locally on your machine. It's a really, really good learning resource if you want to learn about um, open source technologies or IBM technologies. And for visual recognition, we have a whole bunch there. Um, this is one of the easy ones to use, and this one um, identifies um, like broken windows, windshields, uh, flat tires on cars. So somebody's created a custom classifier, which we'll go into today as well, um, to do this. Uh, and then a little bit more, more involved is the Slack chatbot. That, uh, and the way to read this is essentially just reading numbers. Uh, but what's going on here is user comes into the Slack chatbot, and everything they type in goes through um, IBM Cloud Function, which is based on OpenWhisk uh, serverless compute engine. Uh, and from there, it goes to the visual recognition part, as well as, oh, sorry, goes to the visual recognition up here, also goes to natural language understanding. Um, and it's essentially, it's looking for um, you know, pictures not, not suitable for work, as well as, as well as language that's not suitable for work. And then it'll just remove those messages back from Slack. So another use case of how these pieces uh, fit together. And this is Watson Studio. Again, we'll go into this. Um, it'll be more clear. It, but if you, can, if you can sort of make out the part on the left is um, what your dashboard looks like and, and you can have different products in the dashboard. And like I said, with your dashboard, you can have different assets. And one of the assets is um, Watson Services. So visual re recognition service, you can add that as an asset, as a service into your project and then use it. So we'll look through that example. Of, um, actually, you know what? Let's, let's just go through it. Okay, so before, before we get into a custom classifier, Watson does provide some default classifiers. So there's a great general model, which sort of is a catch-all model. Um, and then there's a face model, given a picture, it'll give you um, age and gender and where the face is in the picture. Um, the age one is kind of iffy. Of, of, um, I actually opened uh, a pull request and said, whatever you guys do, just do a minus 10. And they, they, they didn't accept it, so anyways. It usually comes up uh, more than what the age is. Um, but then also the caveat here is all of this comes back with some confidence score. And that's what you look at. Uh, there's a not safe for work sort of explicit model. There's a food model trained on, I believe, like 2,000 different kinds of food. That one does pretty well. And there's a private beta for text model, which is more, uh, it's extracting text from natural scenes. So example being billboards or um, uh, number plates. All right, and then the, the interesting part starts once you get into the custom model. The way I think of it is like if I have a new project, if I'm talking to a client, I would suggest to first use the default model um, or the built-in classifiers, and if they don't, don't work or if they're not good enough, then you go into the custom classifiers. All right, so like I was mentioning, the general one, it sort of, it does a whole bunch of different things. And I have some examples in the following slides, and then we will create a custom classifier and use it in a Java program. All right, so I did, I gave you this picture. And um, you know, it's interesting because this, it basically looks like some sort of sport, but you know, to our eyes, it's pretty clear it's tennis. Uh, but on the, on the right here is the JSON that comes back once you do get in the picture. Um, and there is a hierarchy of reports back. So it says sport, athletic game, and then it does go down to tennis. So it did pretty well. Conference scores do look well, uh, pretty good. Um, and I'm working towards cases where it doesn't work, and then you have to go to the custom stuff. Um, so the face detect. Um, this is the JSON that comes back, and it's essentially telling me it's an array of four different objects, faces objects, 
um, and it's telling me there's a male between 42 and 45, and it's pretty sure about the gender and the age. Um, and then they're saying there's a younger male, a female between 30 and 40, 42, and then you know, um, a teenager in the picture, which looks like it's right. This was interesting, I gave it this picture. Um, if I give it, if, the, if, if, if I give the same picture to the default classifier and the faces, the default one comes back with, it's a school, um, it was interesting, it came back with day school versus night school. Um, and then for detect faces, it's uh, similar to what we saw before. It's coming back with two instead of three, and the reason I think being like it wasn't trained on that type of face, because the person's walking away. Um, but again, it comes back with confidence scores, and you know, a lot of people are, developers well, ask me if, you know, what's good enough? And, and that entirely depends on your use case. Um, you know, if it's a, if you're scanning for like tumors, then you want to be very sure. Um, but if you're scanning for vehicles, maybe it's okay to be off by a couple of dozen vehicles. This is a food model, and um, again, I gave the same picture to a, the default classifier on the left here, and it came back with some sort of plant, some sort of berry, and then all this comes back with some with the prominent color in the picture. And then I gave it to the fruit, fruit classifier, and it was a little bit more um, focused, uh, I guess, it, it was able to figure out some sort of raspberry. All right, so this is, now we get into the custom ones, right? So the reason why this, I, I had to do this one time where I gave it a picture of a Raspberry Pi. Um, and it came back, I gave it to Google, I gave it to um, IBM, and they, both of them mostly came back with computer circuits, some sort of motherboard, uh, computer chip, which is okay, but I wanted to see how much further can I go without actually building machine learning model by myself, or deep learning model by myself, because that's not what I do, but I do need the ability to identify a Raspberry Pi model A. Um, and so that's when I gave it positive images, which are images off model A. I gave it positive images of model B, and then I gave it a whole bunch of negative images, which are images of but that could look like one of those things, but actually are not. So I gave it a Greenle board, Beagle board, things like that. Um, so this example illustrates the same point. Initially, you know, I'm giving it apple, bananas, and pears, and then um, negative is things that are not fruits. And then when I update it, I gave it new pictures of apples, and then maybe I add more negative examples based on what it does, right? So that's the other point I want to make is these models are really live, and so once you train them, you need to constantly evaluate them and see how they're working, and then retrain them over time. It's, it's not magic, even though there are a lot of hidden layers in the, the neural net. It's, it's, it's really, you have to work with it. Uh, this is what our API, the API looks like for visual recognition. Um, this, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. There's a bunch of uh, uh, methods to classify an image. You can give it a single image, or you can give it uh, multiple images, or as a file. Uh, there's a different endpoint for detecting faces. And then for the custom stuff, you can do a whole bunch more, right? So you can actually train them, you can create them, uh, you can retrain them. Um, and then the bottom part here, not maybe not relevant to a uh, to the Java community, but the pre the iOS folks are pretty excited about this. Um, you can download for every custom classifier you create. You can download a core ML model, which you can then use to detect images offline on your iOS device. And the user data is interesting too, so you can tag each image with a, with a client or a user, and then you know, let's, if you use cases, if they, do, they want to leave, then you want to be able to quickly delete all of their data, <coughs> including the model. Okay, so I'm going to show you a couple of things here. First, how do you create one of these custom classifiers? Um, there is a way to do it in the UI, and then there is, of course, the API. Um, how do you test it, and then what does the Java API look like? And then while I was on the plane coming here, I created this very simple like SWT app just to show like, how easy it is to create, um, to add some machine learning, to add some visual recognition in your Java application. Um, which, by the way, I bought the, what is it called, the internet on the plane for 20 bucks. It was an all day pass, I don't understand what, I guess for multiple flights, but then like you can only use it if you're over 30,000 feet and not while it's like there's turbulence. So I literally had like two hours. I kind of bummed about that. <laughs> Guess that's how it works. Okay, before I get into it, that's my app. Let's go in here. So quickly, I have some curl commands here, and we won't go through all of them, but I just want to show you, I do have a custom classifier. 
Uh, before I do that, let me go to this picture. Um, so I do live in San Francisco, and that's our iconic, uh, what is it called? <laughs> <laughs> I should know better. Uh, uh, so here, so this is a simple curl command. Uh, let me merge it a little bit. So essentially giving me a cat key, and you get, I think you get like a thousand classifications per month, so as long as you under that, and then it'll reset. Um, and then you just give it a URL, that's all you have to do. And if I... Um, what happens when it's here? Right, if I were to give that picture to my... To the default model, then it comes back with, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, um, pretty decent, it comes out cable car, tram line, uh, bus stop, street car, right? So that's, that's an easy way to use this, right? I, I have to do no work, just give it a picture and come back with stuff. Um, and it's, I feel like it's kind of cool to understand how this works behind the scenes eventually, but as a developer, if they pull this, like, to get to market first, I feel like it's okay to use, to use something like this. I'm not saying use IBM, like, use what's available, what's good, what works for you. All right, and then this one here looks at a single image. If I were to actually open um, this guy here. Uh, where am I typing? Right, so this is the picture I'm giving it. So it came back with... Oh, did I get the same color? I think you get the same URL. Yeah. No, I guess I didn't copy it. Right, so it does does come back with um, it recognizes the car, the road, the street, and the kids on it. So it's pretty cool. Um, if you give it a zip file, I just want to show you what comes back. I think the zip file contains like a fruit ball and a picture of a dog. So yeah, so for each of these pictures, it's coming back with, um, so for the dog, it's like, it's a domestic animal, it tries and gets to the breed of the dog, I don't know if that is correct. Um, Dog.png, I'm guessing the fruit ball also is a dog. I just mis um, misnamed it. If I were to go to the same kid's pictures, the face model, And I'll be really sad if I run out of my calls doing this demo. I'm <laughs> able to get to the custom stuff. Um, so yeah, if you remember there were two girls in the picture and then it's coming back with the scores for both of them. All right, cool. So how does this custom model look like? So for that, you have to log into, um, you have to create a service for visual recognition and then it'll let you create, it let you go into Watson Studio, which is the machine learning bit. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. How many of you are currently using a sort of language or recognition yeah, application? Zero. Zero. You are? <laughs> Did you, are you creating your own models or are you using um, third party models? I'm creating the JSR for visual recognition for Java. Right. Alright, I'm just going to type it in. All right, if this doesn't work, we'll go to the custom app that I built, and we'll come back to this in a second. So if I now go to data platform, 
Sometimes I feel like I, yeah, even people know I'm doing a demo and they just mess me up every time. <laughs> okay, that's better. I don't know, I still have to launch it. Okay, let's go to the app. I don't want to waste your time. Um, so, yesterday I created this very simple app, and all this says is a simple Maven project. It uses SWT, because that's what I used to use a while ago. Is that, I don't know if that's still a cool thing to do or not. It's not. I can tell the way you're laughing. It's okay. <laughs> but, anyways, it's a very simple project. It just uses, it gets SWT. I was an Eclipse developer for a while, like we used to develop plugins for Eclipse, so. I was wondering that you're working on IntelliJ and you. I, right. I think I think we should all do that. It makes the world a better place. Um, and then there, I have the IBM Cloud SDK. Only two dependencies. And then essentially, I just created this one silly class that will help me classify. Um, I'm just using two. I'm just getting the list of classifiers, which I'll show you why. And then I'm actually using the Java SDK to classify. Um, actually, before I do, the, do this, let me see if my At least this is this is still working. Um, so this is the API that what the API looks like for Java. Um, can I get rid of that? Okay, that's better. Um, so essentially, you're given your API key, and then you have to use some versioning because they change it for so very often. So you have to tell it what version you want to use. Uh, this is how you build your options to authenticate, um, and then you essentially. Yeah, so once you do have the client, once you authenticate it, uh, then you can call any one of these methods. So classify images, that's what we looked at with the Perl command. It's very similar. You either give it a zip file, the URL. Threshold is kind of important. That's where, you know, if it's anything below. That's the confidence score, correct. Uh, so you're telling it anything above that, and then give me results for that. Um, and then that's it. You build it, you get some results back. And what you get back is sort of the JSON we looked at, but it's, um, you know, in this case, it's just an just a Java object that you can then play with. So you get an array of classified images, because you could give it multiple. Um, and essentially for each image, it'll have, it could have multiple classifiers. And for each classifier, it's telling you what classes are relevant about the threshold. And for each class, it gives you a confidence score. So pretty simple. The other methods, um, the detect faces is a different API call. That's the only thing here. Um, there, the other important ones are, of course, you know, you're not going to use the UI to do all of these things all the time. So there are methods to create um, a custom classifier, in which case you give it uh, positive examples. That's the one with the Raspberry Model A and Model B. And you give it a zip file of negative examples, and that's about it. And then you, you have to then check um, for the status, uh, which is a bunch, could be a bunch of different ones. One of them being it's, uh, it's ready to use, and then you can use it. So if I go down here. This is the one where you actually check the status. Uh, it comes back with ready training, retraining, fail, right? So based on this, you can take your next step. Uh, you need, you really have to wait for it to be in the ready state. Um, it usually doesn't take too long, but depending on if you're, you know, what what level you paid for, that of course will put you in the 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 right queue. So it may take a little bit of time. Uh, update classifier is really again very similar, but in this case, you already have created it and you're providing it more positive images, or um, it could be like positive images for the previously created class or, or, or a brand new class. And then you give it, can give it a new negative examples as well. Uh, it does not classify for the negative examples. If you want that to be classified, you create a new class for it. So it's, not, it's just going to say it's, it's either Raspberry A or B. It's or not, not going to say, I'm just not sure it's not. Right, and then the you know, delete a classifier, and then this one's kind of cool, where you can download um, an iOS core ML file, and then um, you can use the Swift SDK to do offline classification. Can an image be shared for multiple classifiers, or do I have to provide individual APIs for each? It, it depends. Um, you would have to, so if the thing worked, essentially, um, you, when you upload these zip files, they go to um, our object cloud store and storage, and from there you tell it to go. So, so if you do want to use it, it's very possible. You have to use the same project. Um, oh, not even the same project, because programmatically you can reach into any object store, as long as you are the owner and share it. Um, the only thing is you have to divide up the zip files appropriately so you can use it for a lot of classifiers. Okay. So 
But going back to the code then, I'm just using two of those. I'm using a classify uh, to do the actual classification, and I pass the, the path file threshold, and if I want to use my classifiers or just IBM's default classifiers. Um, and then my main app, um, it looks like, Right, so there's a pane, I created a pane on the on this side to drop in a mention and then um, you tell it what classifiers you want to use. Right, and then you, you give it a threshold and then, and then it does the work. But again, the point being, um, it was pretty easy for me to do this without understanding too much about um, like visual recognition as a as a like as a science, I guess. Um, so for this one, I actually had a bit of a hackathon and they wanted me to demo the same service. And it was a health-related hackathon. So I literally had stopped at a Walgreens on my way down there and I took pictures of different, like, off-the-shelf medicines. Um, so here's what Mucinex looks like, right? So this is just me standing there taking pictures. <laughs> at some point, somebody came over and they were like, do you need help, sir? And I said, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Doing it for science. Um, and then I took, like, a bunch of that's, you know, different ones, different angles. Um, that's the other point that you need to keep in mind that um, your training data pretty much um, is sort of, of course, sort of the most important thing that you, you know, you, to see what comes out. Um, they give an example of documentation that like, I like to reuse. It's like if you take a picture of a tiger in a zoo and then to do your training and then you go out in the wild and try and classify something out in the wild, that will most likely not do well. The other examples they use is if I'm training with these pictures and if I go to Google and get a stock image of Nightcrawler or Mucinex, that most likely will not do well. So Watson looks at the whole picture, so it looks at the background, the lighting, the shadows, um, the colors it looks at. The one thing it does for you, it will, it will rotate the picture multiple times for you. Uh, so I've seen people like to, instead of this, do video. So they'll like take a video and walk around the whatever subject they want to classify, and then they'll frame by frame, like every 10th or 15th frame, they'll pass that as a... Or like play with colors and things like that, because you can do that programmatically. All right, so similar, similar examples. Um, it requires like 10 images, at least, and I was able to get a bunch. All right, so, so these are all the training images, and as every good data scientist knows, you have to keep your training away from your um, testing. So I did take a bunch of images that was, with this example, it's kind of hard because there's only so many angles I can hold it, <laughs> right? Um, but still, I was able to capture some Im images that it didn't do too well on. Um, uh, you have like, a few examples, right? So probably uh, the model is powerful enough to overfit on your 10 images, so that's why that must be... That's why 10 did pretty well, because, yeah, you're correct. But even then, I was able to, like, walk back and take a picture, and I didn't... All my training examples are close-ups. It actually didn't do well on, like, the... when I was far away. Right, right. Uh, 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 that's right. That means it overfits, right? So it, it just recognizes those 10 images very well, which you gave it, right? But does not recognize... Yeah, I, I, you know, 10 is obviously not a good number of you, trainings. You need, you need a couple of seven. A couple, couple of, they say like a couple, uh, around 300 per class is usually good yeah, for, right. so yeah. Um, but yeah, essentially all I do is like drop this here, and then I say analyze, and it'll go in and it'll do the call to Watson to see what comes back. Um, this was interesting, it did not come back with, of course, Mucinex, and this is a default model. Um, it did come back with some medical stuff, which was encouraging. It also came back with daily products. <laughs> What's going on here? Um, but then, you know, this is the case where I will create a custom classifier. I'll say, hey, use my classifier, and then say analyze again. Um, and in that case, it comes back with Mucinex, which is what this is. Um, and then, of course, I can change the threshold. So now it's saying, there's a high chance this is Mucinex, there's a low chance, that's why I would see it. Um, the picture did not do, but again, the, the point being, I didn't have to do a lot of work to get here, except create the app, right? Um, Does that mean the Watson can't read? Yeah, it can't read. Can't There's a separate service for um, right. the text, but this, this one, one doesn't do it. Right. Right. Yeah, so this one's looking at 
a lot of different factors, but not, I, I don't believe it's looking at the reading. Um, I think, so this was the one where there's more stuff in the background. So if I take this and put it in here to analyze. So this one actually thinks it's mucinix. Um, more than it thinks it's vitamin C, even though it is. And I don't have, any, you know, I can just think about why that happened because I don't have access to the model. That's the downside. Even if I did have access to these models, there are so many layers to these models, it's kind of hard just to but see what's going does on. Does it tell you what the, what the pathology of neuromorphic by the way in which you are using when, mm -hmm. you're, do, when you're doing custom classification? Yeah, no. they, do, they do reinforcement learning, but that's about the... No, no, no. Like, do they tell how many hidden layers, mm -hmm. for example, you're using? No, for this. What, what, what they just say, okay, you're using it and train it till it gives you, like, what the result. So there's, with, you know, with, um, with IBM, like I was saying, the open source versus, the, you know, built on top of that. So in this case, too, they give you access, like, they'll let you do your own training and do your own, like, PyTorch or Keras. So whatever you want to use, they'll let you do that on IBM platform. They even holster models for you, so you have a better control of what's going on. But in this case, they don't check you. But there are multiple levels based on how comfortable you are with this stuff. Um, Is that the confidence interval at the bottom? Yes. Yes, so I can change that. Correct. So this is what this is the threshold that I'm saying. I'm telling it to only give me above. So in this case, let's say 0.45. Nothing went away. But if I go a little bit more, like that list should shrink. Right? I'm not a designer, so don't don't judge. All right, and then I'll, I have a couple here that are not, so I took these ones are from here. And um, if I do that one. So you see it still comes back with the medicine stuff because it's still trying really hard to see color and shapes and all of that. But in this case, I know I'm not looking for one of those, so I won't even go there, right? Um, but it's interesting the stuff it comes back with. I'm going to do one more. Is that it? Yeah. I said zero. I, I said zero. Yeah. And this was interesting. Oh, this. Yeah, this guy. Yeah, it. Like tobacco shop, really. That's interesting, right? So it tries to do. It tries to do its best. Um, yeah, that's, do you have any questions? Like, it's a pretty simple app, I've done on the plane on my way here, so it's like nothing complicated, but if you have questions. So if you want to use like, pre-trained classifiers, probably works much better, right? If, uh, if they provide you pre-trained classifiers for food, for example, right? Exactly. Most probably it will, like, relatively... I tend to use I tend to use multiple ones. So I'll tend to, for example, um, if I give the general one a picture and it doesn't come back with anything medical related or food related, then I won't even go to the specific one, right? But if it, had, it comes back with some sort of class for food or for medical, then I'm like, okay, this is in the sphere of what I'm looking for, maybe, and I'll give it. So it's a very, it's a lot of hidden trials, it's a lot of play with it, see how it works. Um, but hopefully you guys go get drones and, and play the put your own custom classifiers. The exercise in the drone um, challenge is pretty cool. You're building a classifier to identify burned down houses. So with all the wildfires going on in California, I thought that was a good example, very relevant. But you, your positive examples are pictures of semi-burned, burned down houses. Um, your negative class is okay houses or like stuff that may look like a burned down house, but it's not. And they provide you with all the images, so you, you just go play with it. All right, one last try on the uh, on this guy. Should work, maybe I can show you a picture. <laughs> Alright, I'm sorry, the internet's, I'm not sure why, but it's not the internet, it's the, it's the service, I'm not sure why it's dead on me now.
actually. Um, the other thing I can do is quickly to show you, I really wanted to show you what that looks like, is to go into, I have a PDF here, off the slides, but this will, it's a little bit better, I'm not showing anything at all. Can you sort of see? You can do a full screen on your PDF. Essentially, once you get into Watson Studio, you put in your, all of my data assets are my zip files that I use for training. And again, all of that, all this stuff I'm showing here is obviously can be done programmatically. Um, I was just at some point playing with some national language classifiers, but this is where your project can consist of different sort of services. Um, and then, in this case, I've already created my models. So at the bottom there, it shows you the model ID, which I'm using. Oh yeah, so when I, when I make the call to get all the models, this medicines one is the one that's custom, right? So when it comes back, it gives me an ID, so I store that, and then I send it back for the medicine part. Um, yeah, so once you've trained everything, um, it'll give you a way to test it right here in the UI itself, but again, that's sort of, um, you can do it once or twice, but you won't do it often. Um, and the other one, So this is where, on the right here, again, all of these are stored in my object store. And then I essentially, I just drag them into my, um, you know, drag them or I can use the API to create these classifiers. So in this case, I've created three, um, sort of light about the 10 matches. I've given it 19, 10, and 13. Um, and that's essentially all I have to do. Uh, there's lots more to Watson Studio than I want to go in today, but if you have any questions about the visual recognition service, you know. That's what I'll add, I think. And then once it handles the different image sizes too, right? Correct, correct. They have a recommendation, so if they, want to, they, want, they don't want you to put in more than they need, because then you're just using up your um, object store, so space, so they'll, they have a recommendation that you should use. But they do, the other thing to do is, uh, to make it a little bit faster, they'll do parallel training, so if you can give it, double, you can give it multiple zip files, um, you don't have to wait for the, for the model to finish training. Well, what I mean by sizes, I mean resolution. So if you have a small, it, it's going to normalize it first before it does any sort of analysis. It will, but I'm, I'm, also, I'm adding on to that by saying it tells you what to provide. Like it, uh, they have some recommendations, like, like everything else, you know. If you, if you do these many zip files, if you do 300 pictures per class, we tend to do well. Um, so that's sort of stuff. And then resolution as well. I think actually I may even have it here. So yeah, like. They recommend 150 to 200 images per zip file with that resolution, which is fairly small. Right, and then there are some, you know, sort of, um, it doesn't do too well in face recognition. It does well in face detection, but not, if you tell it to find me in different images, it doesn't do that yet. Um, the other thing they're working on is like the video. Bit of it, so you know you don't have to do the framing and send it off. You can send it a video, um, and then it doesn't do all the motion right now. But things they're working on. Um, I wish that that worked, but I think the pictures sort of um, give you an idea. Hopefully, how that looks. Do you have any questions? That's how we need to do it. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you. If you, if you oh. use this uh, in, in convention with what you are saying with OCR, you can probably improve the accuracy quite a bit, right? I mean, have you tried that aspect? Um, well, first you have to develop uh, another thing which would like uh, locate the text fragments in your yeah. picture, which is totally different. Right, it, it doesn't use OCR yeah. right now. Yeah, it is more complicated network which, which, which could do it uh, to recognize text and then start reading text. Probably. Uh, so, like I said, like you, they'll they let you create and host your own models, your own, your, your own deep learning models on IDFAT. So, 
you know, if you wanted to do something, I'm not sure what exactly you mean by in conjunction with, but if I like, do I want to do like a first well, I, I'm path? I'm not sure what I was wondering, I was wondering theoretically, but it seems like you could have it trained to recognize letters of the alphabet, and if there's a few of them in proximity, well, then there's probably words there. Yeah, but I, I feel like there's, that's a whole, like, you were saying that's a whole different this is a that's a whole different class of sort of classification than what they're doing here. Mm -hmm. um, but like I've tried their MNIST like to recognize the letters and images, so, um, so that works pretty well. But that you know, I feel like basically, you have, you, you, have, you have to feed a lot of like text images and classify them in text, and then you use a like sliding window. Whatever. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with how to that. figure out yeah, what the I, text is, and then only you could read with OCR. Okay, so you're saying the input is different into the OCR yeah. model? Uh, you have to pre train, you yeah. have to let it know that you are looking for text, right? So you have to train it to recognize text pieces, right? Before. Yeah, yeah, but I, they are working on, like, I know Google has it, they have their yeah, OCR engine. Right. Same like uh, like uh, auto driving cars, right? You 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 train it to recognize cars before it could actually figure out what's the right. But I think the point, like, they're, they're like we already do a food model. We do you know we do the face model. There could pretty well be an OCR model that, given a picture, will detect text well, a little bit. Right. You you have to recognize. No, I think it looks though. If I pass in a natural landscape to it. It'll detect texts in different places in the picture. I don't know how to tell it, go look for Does it create like bounding boxes around there? It gives me X and Y. Which is right, like faces, right, but right. Then those you could feed you, to your you on your own, yeah. yeah. Google, but we don't have Google Translate those that already. Google is that already, yes. I've tried theirs and actually when I gave them the Raspberry Raspberry Model A, um, it was able to read that it's a Raspberry. I was like, duh, it's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah. Cool. I think I'm done. Thank you.